if you choose to watch to the end of this video, or even listen to it, you had the choice not to. Catholic Church has been under fire for as, well, as long as it has been around, really. Be it by the Seven-day Adventists for believing it's evil, since it's named Sunday as the Sabbath rather than Saturday. Be it by the Protestants for being far too high and mighty over the rest of Christendom and potentially turning against what it means to be Christian or atheists for any number of reasons they care to name. One thing many have raised, and it's not just within the atheistic community, but also the Christian community, is its appropriation of cultural festivals and traditions into the Christian calendar. Now, this has raised the issues of how many Christian festivals over the years, are actually valid and therefore Christian. Now, I've covered this in the history of ideas, so I won't go into too much detail, but this sort of cultural appropriation isn't exclusive to early Catholicism. I would argue that many atheists have tried looking at the meaning of many Christian things till God is barely visible in them. Well, what we have left, anyway. This can be seen in the commercial bends to every major festival in the calendar. Christmas being more about the presents and seeing family. Easter being more chocolate eggs. And Halloween being more about dressing up and going trick-or-treating. Something which I've never done. But I think this extends to certain parts of our reasoning and understanding of the world. Science has used many intricate terms for things that seem fairly straightforward. But some things seem very strongly linked to whatever the Bible seems to be telling us. Words like synchronicity, placebo and nocebo effects, all scientific things that actually demonstrate things in life that priests have been able to teach since time immemorial. One such thing I've seen raised on YouTube channels about religion and atheism is that of determinism. Some claim that free will is cancelled out by determinism because it means we don't really have a choice. Now, at first, I thought this was another example of logical appropriation, namely, in this case, of God's will or destiny. But when I looked it up, it was something really quite different. Instead of an inevitability, that means we have no control over our lives, I found that determinism is a philosophy which states that all our actions are determined by our past actions. Now that's completely different to what I originally thought it was. And since it was a hot topic of discussion, I may have missed it. But I think it's time I should take some time to address it and work out my own position on it. Now, first off, I've never believed in destiny. I like the idea of free will. I have, I have a strong conviction that we have some control over our lives and how we live it. That's why I don't hold much store by prophets or prophecies. Knowing the future, in my opinion, is a waste of time and rarely helps anyone. If it was written in stone, we can't do anything about it. And if it's not, how 
are we to know if it will make a difference or not? I like the idea that God gives us a choice. And whilst we have the freedom to choose either way, he has a plan for us regardless. Yes, it, yes he might guide us back to the path he originally intended us to be on. But he does it in his own way. This can be seen as overall destiny, being out of our control, but we can decide the details. However, I'm not convinced. Life is way too complicated for such a straightforward perception. If you put God in the situation, maybe you can see a way around it, but only if you fully accept what it means to be omniscient, which few people do. Determinism, claiming our current and future actions are based on our past actions, does make sense and could be interpreted as a lifestyle based around learning from past experiences. However, does that mean we can't be held responsible for our actions as a result of past events? That's going to a different moral and psychological field, and isn't something I'm interested in delving into with this video. But that is what the Thomism seems to be suggesting, and a lot of subscribers to this view are using this to suggest that we don't have free will. Does this mean that this is a new way of saying destiny, God's will, or even fate? All things have been seemingly completely wiped out in modern understanding just because all that stuff is fairy tale things. Is this how we explain strange things that happen and leave us with no further explanation? Well, my big problem with determinism is that it appears to be stating you can only be what you are. You can never change, and therefore can't hope to be any different. However, this, so far as I can tell, goes against not only the very understanding of neurology, which is, which says our brains are constantly reshaping themselves, or at least making new connections all the time, it also renders psychiatry and the treatment of PTSD pointless it implies drug addicts, drug addicts are beyond hope and makes the potential makes the purpose of discussion debate and social talks completely defunct i may be over exaggerating the meaning and completely messing my words at the same time but you can't deny is heavily implied. If that is the case, however, why do people bother trying to discuss this with us? Why do they bother suggesting it? If we don't think this is the case, clearly we're not going to have our minds changed. So why bother bringing it up in the first place? Looking into this further, I saw some more detailed explanations and different variants of the same philosophy. Some on individual levels, others on cosmic scales. I'm pretty sure there's a lot more than what I've originally found in this, but bear with me on this. Causal determinism proposes that there's an unbroken chain of prior occurrences stretching back to the origins of the universe. This suggests more of a pattern that has repeated itself throughout history. Now, the rise and fall of empires and regimes could be attributed to that, but I think that's more of a correlation than causal. Physical determinism is the notion that the past and present dictate the future by rigid, uncompromising laws. Nesitarianism rules out all possibility, 
contains that all events are caused and necessarily happen for a reason. Predeterminism claims all events are determined in advance and similar to causal determinism. In short, all of those recently said seem to be based on the same thing. Basically, the universe has a plan for us. Biological or genetic determinism suggests that human behaviour, beliefs, and desires are fixed by genetics. Whilst it's an interesting thing to bring up in the nature versus nurture debate about children, behaviour, or development, it does leave a lot to be desired when it comes to the issue of belief, as I'll touch on later on. Fatalism and theological determinism are both linked to destiny, and so I'm not going to delve into this overly much. But essentially, everything is done for a reason, nothing can be done to stop it, and ultimately our actions count for nothing. I'm trying to understand logical determinism, but it seems to be a binary notion of true or false on propositions. Essentially, one thing is right, the other thing is wrong. I'm not going to explain it, it's quite complicated and delves into concepts that I don't really understand. Adequate determinism seems to be based on the idea that due to quantum indeterminacy, macroscopic events must have some determinacy. My understanding of quantum mechanics implies that the near randomness of the high number of quantum particles increases the chances of a stable molecular structure or mechanical structure with a determinable state. Like I said, it's incredibly complicated. I don't really understand it at all. All of these are understandable to an extent, though I'm not convinced by either of them. Interestingly enough, another explanation in the same thread mentions the many worlds hypothesis. This, however, would preclude the idea of any predetermined outcome, since in order for another world to split off from the others, an alternative outcome must have been possible. Now this is where the question of free will is an issue. If something is determined, any pre-existing stimuli or prior event, then that implies we don't have free will, as we have no choice in our actions. That, however, makes another issue, or whether morality can be considered a factor in our actions. As one notable philosopher, Peter Van in Juan, I think that's pronounced, postulates the moral judgment that X should not have been done implies that something else should have been done instead. This implies that there was something else to do, which further implies that something else could have been done. That something else could have being done implies that there is free will. If there is no free will to have done other than X, we cannot make a moral judgment that X should not have been done. Since a large number of atheists like to pick away at the morals of Christians, any determinists amongst them don't really have a leg to stand on. If we lack free will, then morality is an issue, or isn't an issue, that can be raised at all. I might argue that if God is all-knowing, then that implies that he knows the future, and therefore free will is impossible, even in Christian circles. I covered this before in, in my video, God in a Pot. 
and this is a classic example of the same mindset. C.S. Lewis implied that potential futures are not unknown to Christians, and mentions it twice in the Chronicles of Narnia, where Aslan, his Jesus allegory lion, said on those two occasions, no one is told what would have happened. This puts a whole new understanding on the meaning of omniscience. Not just knowing what the world was like and is like, but what it might have been like, what it could have been like, and what it still could be. They may be different terms of the same thing, but ultimately they can be completely different events. Is there evidence of this in the Bible? Yes, and you don't have to look far. In the third chapter of Genesis, the serpent tempts Eve into eating the fruit from the forbidden tree. If it was a given that Eve was going to eat the fruit, then the serpent wouldn't have needed to tempt her. Many other times exist in the Bible where people do wrong and are duly punished. Two things are bound to get raised at this point. First, determinism doesn't work like that. I know that's not how it's generally applied, since prior action is required to dictate the present or the future. But if you're going to be hardcore determinism, then that is the heavy implication here. Second, if God is good and knows that there that this is going to happen, why does he bother? Now an interesting one, and had me vexed for years, but two things come to my mind. First, the only reason God can punish us is because we have free will to go against his will. Second, he knew giving us free will was a gamble. But without it, we wouldn't be the people we are today. And if you saw this, this dark, tortured, savage world as preferable to many or uh, many other alternatives, you can only shudder at what they might have been like. But is there a middle ground between determinism, or God's will, and free will? Well, I'm inclined to believe in cultural, social, and environmental determinism, all of which are linked to the nature versus nurture argument. This is an argument that says it could be what we're introduced to as children that affects our interaction to the world as we grow up, as much as our genes. Since many people don't in a patriarchal society, and I'm not afraid to admit we most likely are, this is a very good, very good sign, since many people, many women, raised in that sort of society may well accept man is superior, or women have certain jobs. Same with men in that society, hence toxic masculinity builds up. All of this, all of this can supersede our genetics, and therefore how we interact with the world is dependent on our upbringing as much as what our natural inclination is like. Certainly, the culture we live in can set us up to have different effects from the world, and this is why I'm an advocate for religious education in school, since it's all too easy for biases and radicalism to occur in home education compared to a more open school environment where there's a regulation board. Granted, that this doesn't mean that some schools aren't going to radicalise people, and, and there are many examples 
of Christian colleges, which which can basically be introducing young people to and like that. That doesn't mean, however, you are bound to a certain way of living because of how you were brought up. I mean, I've been scanning YouTube for a number of years, and I've seen at least three atheists who were raised in Christian households, and yet now are some of the most outspoken people on YouTube against religion. Whilst, as far as I can tell, they have been in fundamental families, which are notoriously inflexible when it comes to their beliefs. And that can make a difference in coming back. That doesn't change the fact that they were able to turn away from the church and live what I can only presume are good, functional lives. This shows that people can change, for good or for ill. This is not a gimmick for TV dramas or films, but a real-life thing. In fact, I'd argue that because some of them were in fundamentalist families, which are notoriously rigid, that shows that just because they were brought up in a rigid, uncompromising environment doesn't mean that they can't have different views. At least in themselves. They believe they can think something different. And when they see that their families aren't going to come round, they turn their backs on what that family believed in. That was their choice. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. This just shows people can change. Apart from cultural determinism, I'm not inclined to think that the concept is anything more than learning from past experience. Whilst what happened in the past can affect your decision making in the future, that doesn't mean you are bound by unbreakable laws that prevent us from making any other decision. If drug addicts can't break free from a habit that makes them feel good, regardless of the effects it has on others, and it's possible for people to change their ways without chemical alterations of their brain. For example, I'm extremely wary of meeting new people. Since when I went to a different school, I was ultimately bullied constantly. First secondary school, I was bullied. Second secondary school, I was bullied there. Less than the first one, but it's still kept my instincts up. I'm inc still incredibly aware of certain types of people. But despite that, I still make the effort to get to know new people. Whilst well, so I have my suspicions about many of them, and they've often been confirmed in no uncertain terms, I'm still careful about those people. I know that it's merely discrimination on my part. And I can get past it, despite a major case of PTSD in that case. You could say I was due to some friends of mine having an ethos, which was everyone is welcome, everyone is equal, everyone belongs. And I had to really wrap my head around the difficulty of that with one lad who just ultimately confirmed that he was basically the same as all the others of his time. I could tell, tell at a glance he was that sort of person. Like I said, prejudice on my part. But that is the way things go. Biases, prejudice, and negative prior experiences can make things harder for us to do. And the opposite effect will incline us towards following familiar things. But that doesn't mean we can't change who we are. I would argue that God wants us to change into better people. 
both because and despite our negative pasts. And he can give us that chance in totally unexpected ways. I know personal examples mean nothing in the of things, but this is how I faced it. My partner and I came into each other's lives in a manner that could be called coincidence, but I can't see how it can be. Because it wasn't like we had mutual friends, it wasn't like we were looking for each other, nor were we making any point to anyone. We just did something that we normally wouldn't do. It turned out the best, because we found each other. I can't go into detail for personal reasons, but our past experiences left us scarred in more ways than one. And that alone should have made us wary of each other. Yet our pasts helped each other find ways to heal the other. Supporting each other and build on the understanding of each other. We are both overthinkers and therefore have many insecurities of things, but we are willing to discuss them with each other and help reassure each other that we are there for each other. Are we 100% certain about the other? No, we're no, certainly not. But we're not afraid to admit that and look for support from the other. And ultimately, we give us we give each other the best support we can, as the support that only we can, and few others would even conceive of doing. By all other viewpoints, it's merely an impossible statistic. But I think God brought us together at the right time in the right way that we could help each other and enable us to fall in love. This can only mean God meant us together. That our past have shaped us to be the best support for our loved ones. People may say that God is being awful to us by doing very negative things to us in the past, but I would argue that those things make us stronger and make us better people. Does this mean we have to live together and nothing can prevent it? Not at all. Just because our brain chemistry and our libidos are making any other choice seem completely unfeasible. We can choose to break it off at any moment, so to avoid the problems it's bound to cause, or just stop talking to each other entirely. All that is very possible. We choose not to. We choose each other. And that's a powerful thing. Love can make us do terrible things, but we choose to do them. We're not just slaves to chemical impulses. We can make choices. They may be contrary to God's will, but the fact that we understand that and do so anyway shows that we have free will. Yes, I can give another personal example. Brown's and my partner came into my life, my ex tried to make contact again. It was a woman who had held my heart, held every, everything I held interest in for at least 10 years. And I constantly fell back on her, constantly. Even though I knew full well it was just going to be a matter of heartache, a matter of pain. For both of us, and I'm not a person that focuses on myself, I focus on others as well. I knew it was going to cause her pain as well. But I was locked onto her. And I found it impossible to move on. And I knew I was being a bastard by it. She seemed genuine, she seemed determined to ask for help. She seemed like she was actually needing help. I wasn't having it though. 
She knew she could run my charity. I had enough of that. Could be that I was in my life, but me and my partner had well, my partner had barely given any indication of feelings for me, and I wasn't allowing any of my feelings to surface at that point. But it's those situations that make you question when your libido focusing on someone else, because your emotions go the other way. This is where the two different types of feminism start to conflict. Because all of my negative past experiences from my ex were telling me to go away. But all my positive chemical urges were telling me to go back to her. So that's where you get the contradiction. If you start hitting those things, not the one of which is the real deal. You have free will. That cancels both them out. Because you can choose to go against your chemical urges or choose to go against your past experiences and go back to that person. Two different urges. And you can choose which one to follow. So that just shows we do have free will. Just because you can't see how your life could have been any different doesn't mean it couldn't have been something else. As an overthinker, I know that things could have happened differently if the right things had occurred, or, or the wrong things for that matter. For example, I know full well that if I'd stayed south instead of moving north to Scotland, I would most likely would have head over heels another my ex, who I just mentioned, would return to my old job so I could remain with her. Only she would still have broken up with me, since my old job had ruined me emotionally. I would most likely have been, I'd most likely become a depressed junk in an attempt to in an attempt to process that and get through it, burn through all my savings, the most likely been kicked from my job by the time lockdown happened, the hooked up with my best friend, and be a major alcoholic living with her in Hatfield. Instead, I'm a blacksmith and a man driver, granted my bad's not working. And despite the fact I occasionally have a drink whilst doing work or when people are around, I barely touch the hard stuff these days. I had a choice, and I chose. So here I am. So determinism is an interesting concept in itself, and can be a theory for why certain behaviours occur, but implying it with historical or cosmic scale is unrealistic. And the concept of morality is challenged by a suggestion which precludes free will. I'm not given to converting or evangelizing people who oppose my views. Now, that's not because I don't have hope between their butts, but because it's not my job. I'm trying to educate them, not convert them. It's not my job to keep them on the path, but to show them what the path actually is, to be easy to see. We have the choice. We always do. We can decide to walk with God or without him. You may end up doing what he wants anyway, but that's because he knows you. Not because you lack a choice. Just because you know the outcome of football match, or you watched it, doesn't mean the players had no choice 
but to play the way they did. They had the option to play differently, but they still played the game, and that resulted in the outcome. If you chose to watch to the end of this video, or even listen to it, you had the choice not to. What you do next is, and will always be, your choice. Choose wisely, my friends, and God be with you.